Hello, and you are listening to Bill Murphy's Red Zone Podcast. I interview leaders who inspire me in the areas of exponential technologies, business innovation, entrepreneurship, thought leadership, enterprise IT security, neuroscience, philosophy, personal development, and more. Welcome to the show. Welcome back to the show, everyone. This is Bill Murphy, your host of the Red Zone podcast. Today, my guest is Professor Stephen Hicks, who is a Canadian-American philosopher. He teaches at Rockford University, where he directs the Center for Ethics and Entrepreneurship. You're going to like this show for a couple reasons. One, if you have a child that's going off to university, college in the next year or two, you're going to love understanding culturally what's being bred in the universities and really it more deeply by listening to this episode. Number two, if you're interested in hiring the folks coming out of universities right now and you're on the hiring side of the fence as a CIO or an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur, an internal entrepreneur, you're going to like the conversation as well because you, you're going to have a, be better prepared to hire the folks by understanding how they're being trained. So Professor Hicks is definitely not on the left-hand side of the political spectrum. He's on the right, which is why, and he's in the minority on the right. So I am also on the right as well. So I wanted to understand, though, what's going on on the left by understanding the small minority on the right. So if you can follow that train of thought, you're going to understand by listening to this conversation what the minority position is, not the majority. So we cover, and I am just very interested in understanding what culturally is going on, as I mentioned, for my daughter's sake and my kids, but also for my hiring and one of the major themes, and actually the title of this episode, this podcast, is how do you develop a tolerance for being offended on a daily, regular basis? And we talk about this because the current training of the kids coming out is you see this cultural phenomenon of people walking around being offended. They're offended, and it's creating this really interesting, the movement's called postmodernism. And we actually go back to the Roman era to understand how we got to the postmodern movement. But this concept of being offended, creating safe spaces, free speech, this gender and race and identity politics, this concept of white privilege, we get into it, and I wanted to understand it more concretely, again, as I mentioned, to be a bit better prepared. No doubt some of you are not going to find some of the conversations that appealing. I loved it, and I hope you do as well. And I hope you, if you don't love it, I hope you at least are educated and or possibly even entertained. But Professor Hicks is uh, deeply astute on the history and where we are. I found it fascinating. I love culture. I love history. And I hope you do as well. So I want to introduce you now to my wide-ranging conversation with Professor Stephen Hicks. Okay, Professor Hicks, I appreciate you for coming on to the show today. Thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks for the invitation. So I've been looking forward to this conversation with you for, for quite a while. And I have piece through your material in your books and, and website. And because I have a personal interest in my daughter going off to college next year. And, mm. and then plus, uh, as an entrepreneur, I, as I'm perusing, you have these different interest areas of mine lie within your domain. And so I'm, I'm really interested in spending some time with you today. But before we get started, I'd love to, although I, I'm going to introduce you to my audience previously to our talking, maybe you can just give uh, my audience an idea of uh, who you are and, and, and how you got to where you are today. Just the, the general trajectory would be great. Mm. Well, in some ways, I was a late bloomer. I uh, started university after taking a, a year off after high school and working and traveling with the idea that probably I was going to become an architect or an engineer and maybe go into a business with my dad in uh, real estate development up in Canada but I wanted to get a, the way I thought of it was a, like a lifetime reading list of uh, big books, great books, important ideas. So I essentially got to a liberal arts education at uh, the University of Guelph in Canada. And as it happens, I uh, fell in love with philosophy and ended up taking a lot of uh, philosophy courses and so majoring in it. And then uh, worked for a couple of years after that, uh, saving money for my civil engineering and architecture 
career, but was torn and eventually decided I would uh, give graduate school in philosophy a shot and uh, try to become a professor because that uh, seemed like a lot of fun. And that's what I've been doing uh, since then. And so it's been uh, it's been a great ride. Currently, I'm at a, a small liberal arts university uh, just outside of Chicago. And I teach a pretty wide range of philosophy courses. But my core areas in recent years have been intellectual history, particularly European intellectual history and how that has come to have huge influence in the American Academy. And then a lot of themes related to business ethics, particularly with an entrepreneurial focus there. So that's where I am. That's fantastic. There's several jumping off points that we can take, but I I think one of the really interesting ones that we can take is I'm really one of the the pieces that as I do more and more research, I've been building my business for, as I mentioned to you prior, for about 20 years. And I Mm. really haven't paid much attention to the political climate. I haven't paid much attention to really anything around me. And that's just the focus I had to bring to bear to build my business, raise my family, et cetera. And uh, it's funny because as you have a specialty in entrepreneurship, uh, I'm sure you've (laughs) heard that before. But Oh, yeah, yeah. As my daughter yeah, gets It has closer, to be all consuming if it's going to work. Yeah. And I, I mean, I just ju- jumped all in and it was, you know, I, I was prepared to live under a bridge if I had to. And, um, and because I was, I guess, probably willing to do that, it never happened. <laughs> but but, <laughs> right. but uh, right. now it brings me to this point where my kids are getting ready to go to college and we're entering a new era of free speech and we've got to watch what we say and we got to protect people and free spaces and such. And and what, I, I'm just curious from your point of view, what has happened? Where have I been for the past 20 years? Mm. Well, yeah, there has been a, a revolution, particularly in some subsectors, right, of the university, but ones that are influential in that uh, they you know, speak to the value issues more. So in humanities departments, there's been a shift from, you know, what we call the tradition of the classical liberal education, where the individual mind is what we're focusing on. Each individual is uh, is unique. And we're training students to be aware of the, the best technical knowledge and all of the leading theories and to give the student the skills and the knowledge to be able to assess for himself and herself where the truth lies and uh, to enter into the argument and uh, and so forth. But what has uh, replaced that has been what is broadly called a uh, postmodern outlook, where we don't focus on individuals as much as we focus on groups. And so we hear a lot about uh, individuals as primarily members of racial groups or gender groups or class groups or ethnicity groups. And those are seen as more fundamental to a person's identity than their individuality. So for those who have been influential in this approach, uh, they're less interested in training individuals and more interested in uh, teaching people to be expressions right, of their various group memberships. There's been a, a more pessimistic shift that rather than being progressive on Uh, liberal uh, rights, uh, using liberal uh, in a non-political sense there, just uh, saying that people can and should be trained to be free citizens, and that if we do so with uh, tolerance and civil discussion, we can get past our differences and make progress on all sorts of civil issues. What has replaced that has been a more pessimistic assessment that these groups are in an adversarial relationship to each other, And the prospects for those groups getting uh, past their differences uh, peacefully are are, are low. And so much more of a willingness to demonize members of uh, competing groups, less willingness to to, to engage in debate, uh, and more authoritarian or what's sometimes degenerately called political correctness as the dominant method. This has been a long time in the works. You know, the seeds for this can be uh, traced back a half a century or so now. But it has been influential in, uh, especially in the humanities and some of the social science areas. And since most students do take some courses in philosophy and psychology and sociology and anthropology and so on, they do come in contact with it. So there has been a a sea change. And if you haven't been paying attention for 20 years, being busy uh, actually getting productive work done and so forth, it's it's, uh, natural then if you look up now to be quite shocked at what you're seeing coming out of uh, many of the universities. And it's probably a a Trump exaggeration, you know, to be totally out of the picture for 20 years, but it's been pretty close to that. And from the sense that, and actually from an entrepreneurship point of view, I'm not sure, I'm careful to dive into this rabbit hole 
only from the sense that I always balance it out. Is, is this, can I add value to my customers by going down this rabbit hole and can mm. I add value, can I add value to my family? And yes. I think part of the reason I'm diving down is that I have a super conservative daughter and, and I myself lean that way as well. So it's really interesting to kind of see. And, and plus you read the news about white privilege and the crimes that uh, I'm not going to use the right word, uh, but the black movement about uh, racial and uh, in the police force and the br- uh, and brutality. Yeah, black that. lives matter. Black, black yeah. Yes, black lives matter. Right. So, yeah. and I sit there and I look at it and I kind of let it pass it by, pass me by. And it's like, okay, yeah. that's interesting. But now by doing a little bit more research, I'm, when you get right. into the experts, it's like, well, hold on here. Cause I'm close to Baltimore. They had the mayor, the chief of police, the police staff, all of these folks were black, but then there was a white officer that was maligned. And all of a sudden, so it was really conf- not confusing to me, but it was like, sure. why are the facts being squelched? Well, yeah, part of the uh, the understandable thing about being an entrepreneur or anybody who's going to be successful in their field is that you do have to block out a huge amount of stuff so that you can focus all of your mental and physical resources on mastering your field and becoming proficient at it and then marketing it. But there's a danger as well, because then you're not aware of the broader cultural landscape and what's going on there and uh, certainly the the broader political landscape. And those uh, in almost any field of human life are going to influence you and and, and affect how you can do your business or or practice your, your trade, whatever it is. So in the case of entrepreneurs, the realistic thing then is to point out that if you are successful in your business, you're going to be scaling up your business. And when you scale up your business, you'll be hiring hopefully very talented, knowledgeable people. And the first place people look for that is uh, young people coming out of university because they are uh, supposed to be right cutting edge and uh, full of energy and new ideas and so on. So what you need to know is what are they actually being trained in and what uh, cultural attitudes, philosophical attitudes, political attitudes and so on are they picking up during their university uh, their university time. So if you are uh, the the entrepreneur who has scaled up his or her business, uh, you're also the chief culture officer. And part of being the chief culture officer uh, is a matter of being able to work with people of all different personality types, character types, technical skills, and so on, as well as uh, philosophical orientations. And that's where uh, the, the, the postmodernism versus kind of traditional liberal education uh, is going to be important for this generation's entrepreneurs. You know, one of the interesting pieces that I, I explored before we talked is this word postmodernism because it confused me initially, but I heard you give a brilliant and just I want my audience to understand mm. this word from a broader context because I finally heard it a day or two ago and I listened to you explain the history. You went back to the Middle Ages and explain if you could walk my audience mm. through kind of the major epochs and what mm. brought us to a postmodern era, because as soon as you say post, you wonder, okay, well, what about what's modern and then right, what's pre- exactly. pre-modern? Yeah. Maybe you could just get us onto a level sheet from... Okay. So- uh, how about if I ask you for a strict time limit? So <laughs> if we're yeah. going to uh, march it back, do you want a one minute answer or two minute answer? And I'll uh, try to honor one, that. Yeah. The one I heard was you, you started in the middle ages and explain yeah. kind of what was the general philosophy of the in the Middle Ages and kind of what, what that was called. And then you worked up through the Renaissance. And sure. uh, I think just broad strokes, I think everybody would kind of get from previous classes. And then and I'd love for you to kind of hit on Marxism and socialism and kind of general philosophy and then uh, march okay. us into today. And that would give us kind of a lens of where we are today. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll launch in. And then when you want to jump in, just uh, give me a signal and I'll uh, I'll wrap it up. All right, so if we think about the modern world, both in philosophy and history, we talk essentially about the last four to 500 years. And the main features of the modern world, you know, this is striking if you think about how many tens or hundreds of thousands of years human beings have been around. The last few hundred years have been extraordinarily revolutionary. So the uh, fact that we are uh, very science friendly and we have mature sciences and we expect science to be able to uh, continue to push back the frontiers of knowledge to explore you know, in- interesting fascinating things about ourselves and the world that we live in so science and particularly mature science is uh, is a very modern thing 
the fact that we are a technological society, and again, that we take uh, huge amounts of technology for granted, that we're comfortable with technology, and we always expect the technology to be improving. Right? The, the pace of technological innovation prior to the modern world was very slim. In the modern world, we are much more individualistic. Right? We don't divide people into classes and uh, say, as a matter of law, you're only allowed to do certain things and associate with certain other people or marry people or be friends with these sorts of people. We say to individuals, you should be free to live your own own life as you want, and all individuals should have this right uh, equally. And so uh, another characteristic then of the modern world has been a decline of a lot of the ethnocentrism. Uh, you know, the you know, if you go back to the, you know, the history of the, the French and the English, just to take two examples, you know, they hated each other for centuries and centuries. But as we've got further into the modern world, right, they, they've put aside their ethnic differences and to treat each other by and large peacefully and respectfully. You know, they're huge trading partners, cultural trading partners, economic, right, as well. Politically, there's been a, a huge number of revolutions, you know, extension of those basic rights to women, a huge multi-front battle against racism and slavery. It's striking to think that for all of human history, you know, the second or third class status of women was, you know, unquestioned. And then the fact that other people of different races and ethnicities, you know, if we beat them in war, well, of course, we can take them into slavery. That's just a, that's just part of nature. The fact that in the modern world, we by and large put those ideas behind us is also a striking uh, revolution. The widespread markets, the widespreadness of liberal, democratic, republican forms of government, the rejection of old-fashioned tribalisms, uh, old-fashioned feudalisms, and so on. So the modern world has been a very revolutionary in just a few centuries, and chances are good that people in our lifetime, you know, people born in the 20th century, you know, we're like uh, we're like the fish swimming in it. We're not, you know, aware that we're actually in water. It's just the the environment that we are raised in. So, we are, you know, liberal in the classical sense, democratic, republican. Uh, we believe in liberty and uh, and equality. We take science and technology largely for granted, and that makes all of us right moderns. Now, the big contrast is uh, then to what we can broadly call then a pre-modern world. And if we just look at the, the history of the West, because, you know, different parts of the world, the, the timelines are different. From, say, you know, three or four hundred or five hundred uh, decline of the Roman Empire for the next millennium, right, almost a thousand years, right, the dominant cultural framework was a strongly religious one, right, where we're not especially scientific, right, or technology, and we're not especially interested in the natural world. We're focused on, on, on the world beyond the natural world. And to the extent that we're that way, we're not going to uh, be as interested in you know, science and technology and trying to understand the natural world. The natural world is seen more as a place where you live, uh, typically not very long, right? Life expectancies, right, were quite low. And there's a lot of misery, right, in your lifestyle because we don't have modern technologies and modern medicines when we get sick. And we're just focused uh, largely on getting through this life and, uh, and, and what's going to happen to us in the next life. We don't have the individualism, right, of the modern world. People are very circumscribed in what they're allowed to do because of their class location. The vast majority of people are serfs, right, or peasants, right, or slaves in some sorts. And if you're not that, then you're in a guild. And of course, then you have more privileges, but they are privileges. And you're still not uh, allowed, except under certain circumstances, to associate with people above your station. And you certainly don't want your kids to marry anybody below your station. So you have a, a very much uh, hierarchical, class-bound right, kind of uh, society. The notions of separation of church and state, the notion of free markets, uh, all of those are nowhere on the landscape for, for a thousand years. So the point that is in, that in the early modern world, you can start to see this in the Renaissance in the 1300s and 1400s. And certainly the uh, the Reformation and Counter-Reformation in the 1500s was uh, another revolutionary area. You see the developments of the sciences starting in the 1500s and the 1600s, and then a whole number of political and economic revolutions in the late 1600s and 1700s. So it's a, an extraordinarily dynamic right, couple of centuries, and out of that, we get the modern world that you and I are familiar with. So I'll pause there in case you want to jump in on any of that. And all of that then can be a, a backdrop to talking about postmodernism and how it reacts to both of those. Yeah, I, I think that was a, a great backdrop because when you use the word post, it sets it up and nicely. And what I'm particularly interested in, as you explain, the next segment is because I think this is really relevant to all the leaders. And I love the way you tied some of the folks, the kids coming out of 
colleges today are the ones that we're hiring. You know, it's the one that my company's hiring and all the businesses yes. and all the leaders, all the technical leaders and the non-technical leaders, they have to hire kids in their 20s. And I've been having great success with it, with them. But a lot of folks have been struggling. And what would be interesting is as you kind of build through the modern era, through that 16, 1700s, I think you left that into the 1800s, the types of philosophies that emerged you know, in the socialism, the Marxism, and then where we went to today would give, I think, really a good framework for everybody as we then maybe shift it, shift gears and focus on some of the entrepreneurship pieces. Okay. Yeah. So we'll tie this back to the hiring issues. Then that's kind of where the rubber is going to meet the road on a lot of these philosophies, right? So one of the, obviously, issues that comes up in the workplace, particularly in the modern world where it's uh, you know, religious diversity, political diversity, ethnic diversity, sex and gender diversity, and so on. So we can broadly call all of that globalism or cosmopolitanism or internationalism. When you start having people of dramatically different backgrounds starting to work closely with each other, how do you manage that socially, right? And so one of the things that has gone on in the modern world, right, is a lot of experiments of human interaction that just didn't happen before. So men and women, for example, particularly uh, toward the, the end of the, uh, the 1800s, as uh, women's education had increased dramatically, and uh, that enlightenment and modernist push for women's liberty, uh, equal liberty rights and equal political rights and so forth was gaining significant traction. So then uh, human beings start doing in some countries something that never happened before, and that is men and women working together in the same environment very closely with high stakes and pressure and so forth for 8, 10, 12 hours a day. So how are you going to manage that? You need to have certain right, ground rules right in place. Or you'd say it's an increasingly global society, then what that means is, again, on a much larger scale, people of different ethnicities and different religions are going to be starting to work together and people of different races. Again, in cases where the stakes are high, right, the pressure is high, and uh, they have to find you know, a way to get along with each other. So one of the important things then uh, coming out of the modern world is this notion of respect for the individual, right? so that I don't see uh, other people as simply avatars or representatives of some group and that it's your group against my group. But what I need to do is uh, treat each individual uh, as an individual and ask, you know, what are your merits? What's your character? Can you deliver the goods? And the fact that you uh, come from a different racial group or a different religious group or ethnic group, that's really secondary or, or irrelevant. So the philosophical argument for the importance of individualism that comes in the modern world has huge implications then for entrepreneurs or, or people doing business to the extent that people are able to put aside their racism and their traditional sexism and their traditional classism. We're going to be more successful as entrepreneurs, you know, dealing with our vendors, dealing with our coworkers, dealing with our, our customers. I think that's a really good point yes. that you just made. Um, from an individual point of view, I guess what confuses me is, is it seems like what's bubbling up, what I'm hearing is more of a group think like. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Maybe you can build on that then. So this is then the uh, counter revolution, right? Or the counter modernism, right? Or the, the post modernism, because what we have coming out of post modernism is, and there's a, a lot of sophisticated philosophical and psychological and anthropological argumentation behind this, the idea that uh, individuals are, either secondary or ultimately, right, not real. And so there are uh, reinvigorated race-centric analyses, sex or gender-centric analyses, class-centric, right, analyses. And so what all of these views, and there are, uh, you know, they come out of sociology and anthropology and some forms of psychology with some philosophical argument, or the idea is that the individual is only a, a construct, right, that we are born, and this is, you know, only crude versions will take it this far, but we can, as a, as a working example, that the human being, you know, at birth is kind of like a lump of plasticine born into a certain social context or a network of social context, and what that plasticine is molded and shaped into is going to be a function of 
it's class membership. So if you're born in one class with certain economic background, you're going to be shaped to think and value certain things differently from me if I was born in a very different right, economic class, right? Or if you're born into this racial group and I'm born into that racial group, or you're born into this ethnic group or I'm born into that ethnic group. So we, in the strong forms, are totally a product of various social right pressures on us. We don't really have mm-hmm. any individual autonomy, individual agency. We are mm-hmm. vehicles through which these groups play themselves out. See, so what that then bad. means is that when you have people of very different groups, very different racial groups, ethnic groups, and so forth, this analysis, some firms of postmodernism say it's impossible for individual members of those groups to have meaningful conversations and resolutions of their differences right with each other you know so it is your group versus my group yeah it's and it's what's really interesting is this um equality of outcome it's really kind of getting under my skin is it versus like the actual earning of the haven't you used the word agency having the agency to climb versus trying to make the whole groups equal outcome and i think where that manifests in my own business was I had a really strong experience of this. This will be something from your entrepreneurship point of view. It'd be really interesting because I tested out a team concept at one point where literally I would float ideas. I'd float the um, requests into a group and mm-hmm. the group would sort of get excited and, and everybody around was excited that the group was going to get things done, but there was no individual agency within, within the group. So mm. I, I didn't get the outcome I was looking for. So I had to kind of demolish the group and go back to kind of a loosely coupled team, but everybody had their own individual agency to perform the individual task. And then they were kind of backing up each other. But back to our point about equality of outcome versus, uh, is that a problem with when you, you were explaining the individual earlier versus kind yeah. of this group morphing? Is that where one of the uh, manifestations you're seeing coming from that? Yeah. I think there's two related, but uh, also separable points in, uh, in what you were just saying there. I think it, whether you see individuals as individuals fundamentally or as vehicles right through which the group dynamics are played out, you are going to have that issue of when you take individuals and put them into a group, what is the right kind of uh, dynamic, right? If you're going to get some productivity and proper brainstorming and sorting out the good ideas from from the bad ideas. And so uh, even if you are a very strong individualist, you recognize that there's value to brainstorming and being able to bounce your ideas off other people, uh, having people playing devil's advocate, right? And so on. And so what you will then do is structure your group dynamics right in a way that maximizes the individual's thinking. But that is going to be different from the way you will approach setting up those group dynamics if you think that it's only uh, once you get individuals together that there's some sort of co-actional collective mind dynamic that comes into play, and out of that, the good ideas are going to emerge. Now, I'm much more individualistic on this, and there's great value to, uh, to group work. But you know you have to know something about the social psychology, and as you uh, did yourself, you have to do a lot of experimenting with the individuals, and you do have to make it clear that ultimately each individual is responsible for his or her contribution and the follow-up action items that that come out of the group. Right? There is no ultimate uh, you know group project or group product rather that's going to spontaneously emerge just because you've got a bunch of people and you've crammed them into into a group. But what uh, if we get uh, this is, uh, it goes back to the uh, the other issue, the second issue, right, which is then to say if you seriously deny right the agency right of individuals, then uh, uh, the idea that somehow we should reward people as individuals is ultimately right going to to go out the window and you will get some sort of equality of outcomes perspective. You know, so one of the things that then, you know, if you go back to the story I was telling a couple of minutes ago, if you really believe that human beings are more or less plasticine, and it's a matter of luck, right, uh, what social context you happen to be born into as this lump of plasticine, and that what you become is uh, a product of forces beyond your control and not really up to you, then the idea that somehow some people deserve more or have earned more and other people deserve less or have earned less 
is going to go out the window. Because then what you're going to say is the fact that some people end up with more as a result of certain social forces is just a matter of luck. Nobody really deserves more than anything else. And if it's all just a matter of luck, then if we're interested in fair distribution of uh, of the goods that are out there in society, then you know one standard answer is then say, well, you know, it should be uh, some sort of equal distribution. And so what we need to do is, uh, is use various social institutions like governments to redistribute things in a more equal fashion. Or it might be that in a company, if everybody's output is just ultimately a matter of luck, then proper distribution is everybody should get the same wages, same benefits, same honors, and so on. So that's one way of getting to that equalities of outcomes. But haven't we been down this path before where we've been down sort of this, I might not be using all the correct wording, but the, from a Marxist kind of socialist point of view, isn't that group thinking like the group, like we're going to make everything happy for the big group. Haven't we been down that? Didn't it lead to right. like a lot of death, like uh, and a lot of mayhem from Hitler and Mao. And like, I guess I'm, I would be concerned that we're sort of skirting that, that edge again. Is, is that, uh, am I sort of out in left field with that thought? Yeah, so if you take all of these issues that we've been just talking about now in terms of arguments about human nature, how individual or, or group created, right, are we, agency versus uh, passivity, and put that in a, in a business context, right, that's one thing, right, or in a family context, that's another thing. If we scale up those issues to political systems, then no, you're absolutely right, right, uh, Marxism as one of the dominant versions of socialism of the last uh, century and a half now, uh, is a very robust version, right, of, uh, of the collectivized understanding of human nature, right? That, and so the fact that, right, that theory was taken seriously and applied in fairly sophisticated form to political processes and economic processes, and on the basis of that, political revolutions, right, uh, were mounted and successful to the point where by the mid to early part of the mid, uh, yeah, the early third to middle part of the 20th century, over half of the world's population is living under socialist, mostly Marxist uh, inspired revolutions. Yes, that's a large social experiment that we have to take seriously. And if the result of that is, you know, as you're pointing out, a huge death toll, you know, the numbers are almost meaningless. You know, we can say, you know, 60 million in China, you know, 30, 40, 50 million, depending on which historians you listen to in Soviet Union, three or four million in various Southeast Asian countries, African nations, smaller scale experiments in South America and Central America. Yeah, the, the death toll from these broad philosophical theories taken seriously, it's worth pointing out that Karl Marx's PhD was in philosophy and his followers, you know, the activists were also very intelligent men and women, often university educated. You know, so they took the theories and applied them in the best textbook fashion they could think. And uh, once they succeeded in their revolutions, they were you know, able to put the, the theories into practice. And you know, the widespread death and misery is, is a matter of the historical record. So, yeah, my view then as a, as a philosopher right, is then to say, yeah, there is a long chain of cause and effect that has to be traced there, but it's absolutely important that we do so. And we should be learning from the disastrous consequences of socialist practice in the 20th century especially, and uh, very seriously looking back at the philosophical and ideological principles that led to that in the first place and uh, really subjecting them to scrutiny. So it is very disheartening, and this is part of what you were saying, we have been down this road before to see what is now a younger generation, and uh, my reading of them is that they're, they're, they're not people who are historically well-educated. They don't know this history. They don't know that we've been down this road before in dozens and dozens of experiments around the world, and so to them, everything is fresh. They've just got a theory. They've heard from some clever professors that this is the right way to think about things. And they're angry about various injustices, sometimes uh, justifiably so. And so they are uh, putting into practice uh, you know, uh, theories and principles that are, are going to lead to the same destructive results. So what's happening is, for, I mean, in the founding fathers in the United States, if, if someone uh, is offended by their lifestyle back then, whether they were slaveholders or they used the wrong words or what have you, then that becomes reason to malign, which I guess means that we don't necessarily going to respect that historical path because they're deemed to be 
false because of, of, of some belief pattern. So, so essentially, the understanding of history would essentially start to dilute because that was a bad path. Apparent that would be the the wrong way to look at it because it seems like everybody's really offended. You know, between and this partially links to how do we embrace the new generation coming into the workforce if they're so offended by wording by in the need for safety and the safe spaces and such how do you integrate those yeah. people how do you integrate into society yeah so there's a couple of more fine tuning applications right of these very general principles right that we've looked at there's you know this issue of offense right part of the the achievement right i think of the modern world is to say look if you're going to take individuality seriously, then you have to expect that individuals, when they think about things and make their own decisions about their lifestyles, they're going to make all kinds of choices all over the maps. They're going to have different religious ideas, different political ideas, different lifestyle ideas, sexual preferences, artistic preferences, scientific ideas, just everything is going to be very diverse, right, and so forth. And so part of living in a free society is that you should expect to be offended, right, on a fairly regular basis. And so what you have to do is develop a tolerance, right? And so the, all of the arguments about tolerance on religious matters, on, on uh, artistic matters, and tolerating the give and take of debate, right, as we argue about all of our different ideas, right, the, the modern world then says, sure, you know, you're going to be offended regularly, and part of your growing to be a mature person is developing uh, a thick skin so that you can handle the heat that you could, your ideas can be a challenge, that you're willing to see other people living their lives in various different ways and say that's their life, right, not my life. And so a certain measure of being offended on a regular basis is part of the price you pay for, for living in a, in a liberal society. So what you get then out of that is if you back away from the idea, right, that individuality matters, right, and that liberal freedoms, right, apply to the individual matter. If you think that people are parts of a group and that all people in the same group then basically are going to have the same ideas and the same values and that you're in a power struggle with other groups, what you want is for your group to dominate right, the other groups. You want to impose your agenda right on the other group. And so it just becomes then a, then a power play. And one of the things that you learn is since uh, all the people who are liberal and individualist and nice people and civil – are willing to respect people's differences and, and that they are trying to be as civil as they possibly can. They don't want to be offensive because, you know, there's too much offensive, you know, is, is, is going to be problematic. So people learn their manners and learn how to be civil. That one of the, the, the weapons that you learn to use is to say, well, if I am offended right by something, you know, then uh, kind of decent modern people say, OK, I'll try not to do that so I don't, uh, don't offend you right anymore. And so uh, it becomes then a weapon that you can ratchet up right in various contexts. But the interesting thing, though, is and this is another uh, a variation here, is that the use of the offense weapon right, or the offended tactics is very asymmetrical. Right? And this comes out of the uh, kind of the, the oppression studies analysis. The idea here is, yes, we're all members of groups. But in the past, some groups have had more power than others. And those groups have been using their power to their own advantage at the expense of these various other groups that have been on the receiving end. And so in the interest of fairness, right, what we should do is give the benefit of the doubt and maybe do a kind of robust affirmative action right, on behalf of the groups that have been offended against and been exploited and harmed and oppressed right, in various ways. So we're more likely then to give the benefit of the doubt to groups that have some sort of historical claim, right, that says we have been uh, beat up upon by these various stronger groups. And so what works then as a tactic and is to say, I am a member, right, of some group, right, that has suffered harm, right, in the past. And so if I am getting offended now at something that you, as a member of a more powerful group that has done bad things in the past, then I should be the one who, who gets the deference, right, in this particular case. In any conflict, the tie is going to go to the, the, the side that has the greater claim to harm and offense, right, in the past. And so once that asymmetry principle, right, is accepted, then it becomes a very useful tactic 
to go out of your way to be as offended as you can by ver- as many things as you possibly can, because you know that's going to put the other people right on the defensive, and they're going to say, oh, I guess I owe it to them to give in to them on this particular thing. And then uh, you know, the more of those little victories you can collect, the more power you get in your institution or, or in your social circle, right, whatever it is. So the interesting thing is then, you know, if you take the historical analysis, right, the argument, at least in our social context, is going to be it's males who have been offending against females, right? They have been the oppressors. And so anytime now females are able to claim some sort of offense, we need to give them the benefit of the doubt on that, right? Or historically, it was whites against various non-whites. So now, if you can make a claim to offense as a member of a non-white group, that has a certain amount of cultural power now, right? Or it was Anglo-Saxons or Protestants, right, or whatever, those ethnic groups that had the dominant power in this country. So if you are not an Anglo, not a Protestant, right, a member of some ethnic minority, and you've got some sort of a grievance claim, that has special cachet and power now. So it's the assertion of minority interests, but using the being offended tool Right, as a as a weapon in the current social environment. Okay, I see, and that that links to the term which I've had to research, the white privileged term, and then also that's right, the that's safe, right, the safe space and and the being fa- okay. This all makes sense, um, right? And then the privilege is a bit of a term of art. It's uh, in, to my way of thinking, it's an anti concept because a privilege is some sort of authorized institution that has power. And is able to grant you know special rights. So you know if you're a member of a country club, you have certain privileges that people who are not members of that club have, had, right? Or under old feudal systems, right, uh, that the monarch could grant privileges to certain individuals, but not to various other individuals. So a privilege is an advantage, right? That's given by a social institution and often arbitrarily doing it so. But what uh, has happened in the last generation is the concept of privilege has been broadened, kind of any advantage that anybody has, we were going to call that a privilege. And that takes away the idea that there are advantages that might be earned, right, by your individual effort, right? Uh, So it obliterates the concept of an earned advantage. Everything that you have just as a privilege because you happen to have been born into the right family or at the right time or in the right country, things that have nothing to do with your individual agency. So, yes, it's all networked. Well, it seems like we've been down this road before, but I, I, I appreciate you for bringing us to that point. So as we round the final turn, I do want to go back to entrepreneurship and innovation because a lot of the folks who listen to my show are the innovators in their organizations, either because they invented and created the organization or because they're in a position of entrepreneurship within. within. And also, yes. I, would, I have never had anybody talk about ethics, though. And maybe we can wrap up with innovation. I'd like to kind of launch into that, though, with a conversation about ethics. And yeah, absolutely. Maybe kind of give me your general ideas of what, how you see ethics and social responsibility and and whether we're overdoing it or whether we're underdoing it in the world and where you see entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs playing, playing a role yeah. in that. Well, yeah, my take on ethics in the, in the business ethics community is uh, currently a minority position right now. And for much of its uh, professional life, the last half century or so business ethics has been kind of dominated by the idea that ethics is about kind of a, a sermon, right? That what you do is you sit on the sidelines and you watch people in business do what they do And then whenever they mess up and make a mistake, right, you jump in and say you shouldn't have done that. So you look at the problem cases and ethics then comes to have a reputation for being kind of a a, a don't do that, right, or don't do certain things. Whereas my view is that ethics, first and foremost, should be focusing on the positive. So we're living our lives and we want to live the best lives that we possibly can. And that's, of course, a big, huge project and it involves many right components. But when we think about our business lives, that's going to be an important part of our lives. The core ethics issues here are, you know, am I going to go into business or am I not going into business, for example, I'm going to try to get a living by being a parasite and stealing, right, from various other people, or I'm going to be lazy and expect my parents or society as a whole to support me, right, in various ways. So 
My view is that right from the get-go, people who decide to go into business are already making a positive ethical commitment because what you are saying is, I am going to take responsibility for my life and I am going to make a living right? by my efforts. I'm going to be a value creator and a value producer. And I think that that is something that business ethics needs to start with as a foundational principle, giving honor right, to people who go into business right, as their mode of surviving in the world. Right? I'm not trying to be a military conqueror and just go out and kill people and take their stuff. I'm not going to be a back alley mugger. I'm not going to be a, a lazy guy on the sofa in middle ages whining that I never had a chance in life. So the emphasis should be on positive value creation and honoring those people who do engage in positive value creation. Now, another than immediate component, you mentioned social responsibility. I think right at the foundation level built into the practice of business is a high social responsibility because what you do once you start making stuff, creating things that are valuable, is then you try to sell them to other people. If we take the producer's right or standpoint here, and what that means is right, you are offering right something to another person, and you're of course you're honoring that person in the sense that they can look at what you have to offer and say yes, I like that, or no, I don't like that. If they don't like that, they're free to walk away. Right. And also, if they do like that or they show some interest, you enter then into a negotiation phase. But that's a peaceful discussion, right, that you're having about the features of your product or service, how much you're going to charge and all of the various things that we negotiate. And so you are committed, right, as a matter of principle to offering something of value to another person and trying to deal with that person on a peaceful basis. Right. And of course, you expect a certain measure of justice right your way. You're the one who has created created some valuable product or service and the customer is honoring you right by payment saying wow this i think is going to add value to my life i'm willing to give you say a hundred dollars right for this and so what you're committed to is the idea then of peaceful interactions right with the customer and the customer is committed to peaceful interactions with you and built into this transaction is the idea that both of you should walk away from it better off right so it's going to be a win-win transaction right so the deal goes through, you shake hands, you sign the contract, and then you each say to each other, thank you, right? You know, uh, thank you for doing what you do, right? If you're the seller, you're thankful that the person brought money to the table. If you're the person who's the customer, you're thankful that the person made the product right or service. So my view is that when we think about business ethics, we should be framing the whole discussion in terms of these very positive things. People committed to responsibility, to making value in the world, to dealing with other people peacefully and to be always seeking the win-win transaction. Now, out of that, of course, as business gets complicated and people have mixed motives and sometimes we get tired and we're tempted to cut corners, there are people who are going to try to cheat right, in various ways. And so part of business ethics also has to deal with the negative. But I like to frame all of discussion of those negative things within a very a, – a, a deeply positive, honoring understanding of what the business enterprise is all about. Do you link social responsibility and ethics together, or do you kind of break them? And I guess what I'm referring to there, there seems to be a, a corporate guilt to social responsibility. And am I accurate with that? Or, or like, are we doing? Are we, I'm sorry, are we did you say the word guilt along the way? Yes, like almost yes. like a corporate guilt, or it's almost like a badge of honor, or like we're going to give five dollars for every pair of shoes to the poor in india but the guy who had that idea probably was very much aligned with that concept but the more we carve out these programs for others it doesn't seem to be quite the, as social responsible as as yes, um, right. uh, anyway that's where i'm going with it okay so uh, social responsibility is uh, also a kind of a term of art within the business ethics community you can use it, of course, just neutrally to say, all right, we are social beings and what are our basic responsibilities to each other? And, you know, my view is the one that I just sketched out before, that we should respect each person's individuality and their freedom. And if we're going to interact with each other, the basic social principles that are that we're going to trade with each other peacefully and seek the win-win. So that's my understanding of the basics of social responsibility. But all of that is very controversial, right, in the literature 
And there are kind of many leading theories right, of business ethics that don't frame business that way. Instead, they have a much more cynical understanding of the business enterprise. So, you know, you've probably heard the, the, you know, the phrase business ethics, right? Isn't that an oxymoron, right? Or isn't that a, a contradiction in terms? And there are you know, any you know, number of people historically and still in our generation who believe that what it is to be successful in business and what it is to be successful morally are very different things in tension with each other, right? Or that they just run on parallel tracks to each other. You know, now, one sign of that is, if I, yeah, is, is this guilt word, right? That, you know, if the idea is I made a million dollars last year, and if I know that I actually made a million dollars, right? By producing goods and services that are genuinely adding value to other people's lives, right, then I should feel proud, right, of, of what I have done. That's an amazing accomplishment for any individual to do. But there are approaches to business ethics that turn the idea that you could take pride in creating value is almost invisible to them. That in some sense, anybody who has acquired a million dollars must have screwed somebody over right along the way, right? Or if you've got a million dollars, that means somehow other people are out a million dollars, that your gain is their loss. And so they're not in a position, theoretically, from their understanding of, uh, of the way the business world works, to honor people, right, who make a million dollars. There's always this tinge of suspicion, right, associated with it. So what they're then willing to say, and this is their capital C, capital S, and capital R, capital or corporate social responsibility, their idea then is, if we're going to get people to be socially responsible, we should get them to be less interested in being profitable, right? Because profit is kind of a dirty word from their perspective. Or if they have made a lot of profit, then they do need to atone for this in some sense. And the way they can atone for it is by giving some of their profits away to other people. And then we'll kind of uh, say, well, I guess it's okay that they made the money because they gave it away. To me, is a very deeply alien ethics perspective but it is out there and it is prominent both in the professional business ethic literature and in the culture more broadly. This is fascinating because I actually was wondering, why are you spending so much time on ethics class? Like I looked at your ethics class curriculum and your, you have beautiful, great videos. We're introducing these topics and I'm like, God, why is there so much time spent on this this topic. And then mm. it finally mm. just dawned on me because I literally go to a coaching group for entrepreneurs because, you know, you're surrounded by no one as an entrepreneur. You're the top of the food chain. And so, you know, it's very important to surround yourself with people that are better than you. So I go to, I, I yes. actually go to a couple different groups. So I get exposed to people that are better. And one of the big things that this particular coach works on is getting rid of entrepreneurial guilt. Because absolutely on, yes, entrepreneurs like they sit there and you go, oh my god, I'm not, I, I don't deserve this much. But you sit there and then finally, you almost have to reteach yourself. No, 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 no. You're one of the two, three, four percent that that succeeded at this, but you're creating value and you're creating jobs and you're creating absolutely. Income. You're putting their absolutely. kids in school. I mean, all value for the employees, value for the for the whole community. And finally, it dawned on me about this ethics piece because. I didn't realize as you were talking, I'm like, of course, of course, of course. But then you said, I'm like, oh, but he said he's the minority. And then yeah. and I'm like, oh, I get it now. So you are a voice in the minority right now. That makes a ton of sense for me. No wonder why your message seems so obvious to me. But yes. I was wondering why it was so minority. But I get it. I get it. Right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So if you take the, the core issues in uh, in business, right, the, the issue of productivity, the issue of trade, the issue of competition, and the issue of uh, property, right? That whatever you have created is yours and ownership issues there. All of those are, are hotly te contested. And so, you know, just being raised in the culture that we are raised in, right? We're familiar with the arguments that say, you know, profit is a, is a dirty word. And, you know, if you are in the nonprofit sector, then just automatically you are kind of morally superior because you're not being motivated by profit. So that's one cultural indicator. And the opposite position, right, is if you know that profit is a measure of how much value you have created. Right? So here are all the resources that you've used. You've transformed them into a more valuable source. Someone's been willing to pay that for you. Right. The profit calculation is a measure of how much good, right, you have done, right, in the world. So profit is a deeply moral, right, enterprise. And we're familiar with the arguments about competition, right, that competition is healthy. It, it leads people to strive to be better than they otherwise would. It brings out the best in us. 
that we all want a, a good competitor out there to keep us honest and uh, and and push us harder than uh, than we otherwise might go. And the other side of the debate saying, oh, no, no, competition is something that sets human beings against each other. It brings out our, our worst, our basest insights. And in the name of competition, we're all going to uh, turn into savages, right, the more competitive we are. So there's that debate. And that's a, a, you know, a deep debate in our culture. Debates over property rights. You know, if you have earned something, should you get to keep it with no strings attached, right? Or do we see property as some sort of a concession from other people? And if other people have various needs, then various sorts of uh, agencies can come in and redistribute your property right, to other people for various collectivistic or other kinds of social purposes. So our deep debates over, over property right, and its status are ethical right, at root. The idea of, uh, of trade, right, that uh, we should see trading partners right, as, as honoring each other. You know, this is one of the things that we're having on the global level right now, right? Or is trade between countries, right, something that ultimately is is zero sum? And you know, what are what, what counts as a fair trade or not a fair trade? You know, right now, of course, with uh, President Trump heating up the trade wars with China and, and various other places, those deep arguments over the nature of trade and whether you know free trade is mutually beneficial and should be honored, or whether some sort of controlled and restricted trade in the name of a different conception of fairness is uh, is necessary. So yeah, everything is hotly contested. But I would say you're right. You know, entrepreneurs, I think naturally, right, and in their bones feel a certain way about productivity, about profit, about trade and competition. And I think implicitly they are the healthy ones, but they do need to step out and be aware that in the broader culture, everything that they stand for is hotly contested. And there are a lot of people who are just in principle hostile, right, to the uh, the idea of entrepreneurs. This is not an overstatement, but every day, Right. Among the people I read, my, my fellow professors and so forth, I read people uh, for whom entrepreneur is a is a dirty word. Right. You know, they think entrepreneurs are a kind of cancer right on society. Right. And again, that's not rhetorical overstatement. Well, I think the big point here is broader culture and the broader culture that we as the folks listening and myself and the hirers, you know, we're the ones hiring the talent. And it's in, it's super fascinating to me because you're essentially are one of the teachers of, of the next generation and, and, and are aware of that cultural movement more so than I would be or folks of, that are in, in, the, in the business world like this. But I, f- I find this completely fascinating to me and to, to feel like that there's a whole movement that's sort of against the uh, entrepreneurial side because I, right. I'm of the, I'm, I just, you know, I, I think, you know, we can yeah. solve so many problems by by having productive citizens, by having jobs. I mean, we just can solve so many problems. Absolutely, yeah. Well, I think it's all part of the uh, part of the division of labor. You know, as you're saying, for you to be good at being an entrepreneur, right, you have to focus on building your company. And the same thing for me on the other side of the division of labor, right? I'm yeah. educating the people who are going to work for you, and I have to do my job well if they're going to be the kinds of people who can flourish in your entrepreneurial environment. So Completely. Yeah, I, I need to do my job, and you need to do your <laughs> job. <laughs> And well, uh, we, we both get pushback. It completely. And I, 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 first of all, I want to thank you for your time today. This is um, as fascinating as I thought this conversation was going to be. Great. Yeah, my it, pleasure, it, Bill. Thanks for was. having me on. Really uh, interesting questions, too. Professor Stephen Hicks, this has been a great. And I will put links up to you and to your site and to you have just this incredible amount of resources on your on your website. If people want to reach out to you, would you recommend they go there? Yeah. Um, would, yeah. Okay. StephenHicks.org would be the best place to go. Or my uh, Center for Ethics and Entrepreneurship, we have a a site for our university-based center as well, and there's some resources there. Although all of it, all a lot of it is at YouTube, as I'm as I'm sure you know. Yeah, so we're gonna link to your YouTube, and we'll we'll we'll, uh, link up on all of your sources. But uh, this is fantastic. Thank you, Professor. All right. Well, all the best to you and your business and your podcast. Sounds like you got a good show going. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks again. Great. Bye Bye for now. So there you have it. This wraps another episode of Bill Murphy's Red Zone podcast. To get all the relevant show notes, please go to our blog at www.redzonetech.net forward slash podcast. Additionally, make sure you go to iTunes and leave your comments in iTunes about the show. This helps our show rankings enormously and it helps support the show. Until next time, appreciate you very much for listening. Thank you.